Our keynote presentation today, The New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge, will be given by Mike Billington, Executive Intelligence Review Asia Desk, and a co-author of the report. Mike? You click on that? Yeah. Or it's on there already. Start it up. Yeah. No. Yeah, good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you all. <clears throat> we've, we've heard clearly from Dennis uh, of what the American system tradition is, the system of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, <clears throat> and we've heard from Helga of the stark um, choice that we have to make today. Uh, very much like the choice that uh, Martin Luther King made, where each individual is faced with the question of whether or not they will take up the mission to deal with a crisis th which threatens literally all of civilization. And <clears throat> uh, I want to go through today with you the uh, general contents of this report, an extraordinary report, which we worked on for almost a year, uh, a follow-up to an earlier report that was done in 1997, which I'll discuss a little bit. Uh, in the sense that this report poses the solution that we have to convey to the American people, to the European people, and to the world, that there is an alternative to the disaster now spreading through Europe and the United States, economic collapse and the onrush to a war which will become, perhaps within days or weeks, a thermonuclear confrontation which could lead to uh, the end of civilization. Uh, the alternative lies, ironically, in rediscovering the American system. And what we see in the contents of this report, that most of the rest of the world, outside the United States and Europe, is now engaged in one of the most fantastic uh, unleashing of industrial, uh, infrastructural, scientific, education policies that the world has ever seen. You could perhaps compare it to what Roosevelt did in the 1930s, but that was just in the United States, although it had the potential of going international. It didn't. Uh, unfortunately, when Roosevelt died, the, uh, his follower, Mr. Truman, helped the British back into their colonies, which Roosevelt intended never to happen. But now we have the opportunity, and it's not being led by the United States. It's being led by the BRICS nations and largely by China. And I want to go through that. Let me just mention that this last week here in the United States has seen an extraordinary uh, explosion of political rage over two many issues, but particularly two issues. You're all familiar, of course, with the fact that a very courageous Democratic Senator, Dianne Feinstein, uh, withstanding massive pressure, released this report on the levels of torture carried out by Bush and Cheney. Uh, and continued under Obama despite the fact that he banned torture and continued under Obama in the sense that he has refused to bring prosecution against these international criminals. And he has continued to refuse to release major portions of the document showing them to be criminals, despite the fact that even the United Nations says that international law doesn't suggest that they be brought on criminal charges. It demands that these criminals be brought to justice. And this includes emphatically, in the words of Ben Emerson, the UN uh, rights, human rights rep uh, rapporteur, that this means the people at the top who, who brought about this process. This has, a second incident happened just in the last few days when in the passing of the budget to prevent another government shutdown, the collaboration between President Obama and the Republican leadership and Wall Street rammed through a rider to the budget bill, which wiped out the little tiny piece of the Dodd-Frank bill which actually did something, which prevented the banks from doing some of their derivative trade, their gambling, off to a different institution which would not be backed up by the taxpayers by government bailout. The Citibank wrote a, 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 a rider that said, let's do away with that. Uh, it was lobbied, there was a revolt by both Republicans and Democrats, by Tea Party Republicans and progressive Democrats against this treason 
against America, literally saying we're going to allow not only another 2007-2008 collapse, but something far, far bigger, since we now have two to four trillion, quadrillion, quadrillion, a, a thousand trillion dollars in these gambling debts sitting in our banking system, which they're now saying we have to bail out yet again. But the, the result of this, this barely passed, and it, it barely passed because our political parties are now in shambles, both the Republican and the Democratic Party. The fact that Obama collaborated so blatantly with, with not only Wall Street, but with Jamie Dimon personally, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, who personally got on the phone with Obama and with Boehner to demand that this policy be put through. And we'll hear more about that from another speaker today. So the, America is on a, a cusp. We're in a position of tremendous upheaval. It's directionless outside of what we, we provide. And this report is, in a sense, a handbook that you can present to anybody in America or anybody in the world and say, you want to get out of this disaster, you better, and here's the way to do it. Here's exactly what can be done. So I want to review this a bit. The, to do it, I want to give a little bit of history. In 1983, uh, Lyndon LaRouche succeeded in getting Ronald Reagan to adopt a policy known as the Strategic Defense Initiative. It got called Star Wars, but it was called the SDI. Actually, LaRouche called it Beam Weapon Defense. We had organized for this for six or seven years. The idea being that the world at the time was, was guided by the British idea of MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, that Russia and the US both had massive nuclear weapons capacities. We both knew that if we started a war, we'd blow each other up, and that's supposed to stop war. Well. Okay, but it also kept the world divided. There was no way of bringing the world together around dealing with the issues that face the common aims of mankind. And LaRouche said this is insane. We have to use new scientific concepts, new uh, technological ideas to bring these two sides together. And the idea was build space-based particle beam and laser beam defense systems that could stop nuclear missiles, could stop a nuclear war, could end war forever potentially if it was coupled with the Hamiltonian kind of economic policies that Dennis discussed. So this, uh, Ronald Reagan adopted that program when LaRouche got to know Reagan during the electoral campaign and subsequently. Uh, it, it was rejected by the Russians who were then led by a British asset named Andropov uh, and it was ultimately undermined in the United States when Reagan was shot in an assassination attempt and subsequently succumbed to the Alzheimer's and his vice president, George Bush, ended up taking over, largely running the administration and then becoming president. The son of Prescott Bush, who personally financed the rise of Hitler. Um, so that didn't happen. Uh, and LaRouche had warned his, uh, he was doing a back-channel negotiation with the Russians promoting this idea. Uh, and he warned them if they didn't adopt it, that within five years the Soviet Union would collapse. And indeed, six years later, we saw the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and then within two more years, the collapse of the Soviet Union. But Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche did not gloat that, oh, now we're the only superpower. Uh, as the neoconservatives did. They said, no, now is an opportunity, uh, again, to end the threat of war forever. How? Through development. Peace through development. And they launched a proposal for the development of what became the Eurasian Land Bridge, or the New Silk Road, that Europe and, the, and, and Asia could be united through high-speed rail connections, through Russia, through Central Asia, and in that way, develop the entire area through which these transportation corridors passed and bringing about peace rather than conflict between these nations. Of course, that also did not happen. Instead, Bush chose to send in uh, bankers to loot Russia to the bone, committing genocide against the Russian people, uh, and beginning to move NATO up to the borders, as Helga discussed today, which has led to where we now stand in the threat of a thermonuclear confrontation. But that idea was very widely received in Russia and in China. And over the period of the 1990s and 2000s, 
Mr. LaRouche was in Russia repeatedly. Mrs. LaRouche was in China repeatedly. Uh, basically building this idea that we can and we must bring Russia, China, and India, and they were both in India, by the way, repeatedly, meeting with Indira Gandhi and others, uh, uh, saying that these three great nations have to bring about, in collaboration with a, an America, changed back to American system principles. Then we can bring about the defeat of this British imperial design which we're facing today. Uh, and in fact, now th these ideas of Lin and Helga LaRouche are being implemented by the BRICS powers, uh, and we must bring about the United States joining with those BRICS nations. There's a petition here, I'm sure it's outside, right? Which all of you should sign, calling on America to join with the BRICS, to up accepting Xi Jinping's proposal that we join them. Now, uh, this is the report. Go, oh, I'm gonna do my own maps here, hold on. Now this is, this is the map from the original 1997 report we did. Helga uh, LaRouche organized with the Chinese government a conference in Beijing in 1996 on the Eurasian land bridge where this idea was laid out. You can see the northern route, which is the old Siberian railroad, the central route that goes through uh, Kazakhstan and, the, and Central Asia into Europe and down into the Middle East, and the southern route, which uh, still does not exist. It has not been built through Southeast Asia. The central route that did not exist at that time is now functioning. There's a railroad leaving China and leaving Europe every day carrying freight back and forth. It needs enormous upgrading, but it's functioning. It's starting. This is the process that's been unleashed largely by the Chinese since that time. Um, and I think the thing to notice is that these land bridge ideas are corridors. They're not just getting from one end to the other. They're creating a condition like the Trans-Siberian, uh, Trans-American, the Transcontinental Railroad. It opened up the interior, it made it possible to build new cities, and in this case, nuclear-powered nuplex cities, which is what we have to do if we're gonna open up this vast territory. It's based on a principle that came from Gottfried Leibniz. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz was, in a certain sense, was one of the leading mentors to Lyndon LaRouche, the great uh, the great philosopher, scientist uh, from the 17th and 18th century, uh, who I could say a lot about, but he was in collaboration with the Jesuits who were in China at the time and began a journal called Novissa Masinica uh, with news from China, which uh, basically conveyed the incredible discoveries that the Jesuits are making about Confucianism and this advanced culture in China, a culture which at that time was far more advanced than Europe. And what Leibniz said, you can read that, whoop, um, is, I consider it a singular plan of the fates that human cultivation and refinement should today be concentrated, as it were, in the two extremes of our continent, in Europe and in China, which adorns the Orient as Europe does the opposite edge of the earth. Perhaps supreme providence has ordained such an arrangement so that as the most cultivated and distant peoples stretch out their arms to each other, those in between may be gradually brought to a better way of life. And this is precisely the guiding principle of peace through development, which has been the, the core of what uh, LaRouche has been, has been putting into place. Now, this is the map from our new report. It's actually, it's on the back cover of the report. If you look in the back, you'll see this map. Um, and I'm going to just very quickly, because of time, sort of point at a few of the main, uh, the main development projects, some of which are already underway, some of which are being unleashed today as we talk because of this BRICS process that began this last summer, and some of which we have to make sure come about. And they're not yet started, but they have to. Um, the, if you look at number two there, connecting Alaska and Siberia, that's building a tunnel under the Bering Strait. And there's a history to that as well. In 2006, the Russians held a conference, uh, and Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche were invited, and Mr. LaRouche gave a keynote address on building a tunnel under the Bering Strait. And Vladimir Putin at that time said, this is a war avoidance policy, because already they were beginning to demonize Putin as the new Stalin. Russia is out to get us. Uh, and there's a whole history to how that was being unleashed by the British 
uh, and certain foolish, dumb Americans were going along with it. So Putin said, let's pose to the Americans what our common aims would be in connecting the totally underdeveloped Russian Far East and the totally developed American, Canadian, and Alaskan Far Northwest through a rail corridor that would open up trade, transportation, and so forth through that entire region. This is still the intent of the Russians. They have actually begun to build the rail heading up towards that strait, even though there's been no response from the US. And I think it's because they have confidence that the LaRouche movement is going to succeed. Um, if you look at the rail connection that goes up to the Bering Strait on the American side, that also has not been constructed, even though it was an attempt to do it way back at the time of the Civil War, to build a rail connection up through the US, through Canada, into Alaska, and then up to the Bering Strait. Now, that's a development corridor, too, which we need to develop. But follow that down now, down through the United States, Mexico, and Central America. You run into something called the Darien Gap. There's about a 100-kilometer stretch there, which is marshland, for which there has never been a road or a, a railroad built. This is absurd, and it can be done. It's not a technological problem. It has to be done. This, again, is something we fought for for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, so that you could take a train from southern Argentina all the way up through the Americas, through Central America, the US, Canada, Alaska, into Russia, down into China, over to Europe, down into Central. You could grid the world with steel, which is an idea, again, that goes back to Abraham Lincoln's time when Henry Carey, his economist, wanted to grid the world with steel. Um, there's many, uh, there, there are both links and corridors, links linking places that have been disconnected, like the Darien Gap and the, and the, uh, the Bering Strait. Uh, there's many other links. I won't go through them now. You could link Japan to the Sakhalin Islands and then to Russia through the north by bridges and through the south to Korea, which could literally bring Japan into the, uh, into the Asian continent. You could connect Malaysia and Indonesia across the Malacca Straits that would bring Indonesia into the continent. Um, you could connect Europe and Tunisia with a bridge under the, a tunnel under the Mediterranean Sea. You can imagine how that would open up trade and collaboration between Europe and Northern Africa. So these are all uh, links. The development corridors, I think, are obvious. The, the Eurasian land bridge itself, the new Silk Road uh, developments, and we'll go through some more of these in a few minutes. There's also the Maritime Silk Road. Xi Jinping issued the new Silk Road development belt through Central Asia, but also the blue line you see coming down from China through the Malacca Straits, through the Indian Ocean, up through the Persian Gulf, all the way through to Europe. That's the Maritime Silk Road. It's based on the great treasure ships from the 15th century in China. At the time that Columbus was discovering America on what compared to the Chinese ships were puny little boats, they had ships three times bigger than that with thousands of people manning these ships, uh, led by the great Admiral Cheng He, who was making multiple trips along that blue line all the way over to Africa, uh, down the African coast to Madagascar, bringing back diplomats, bringing trade, and so forth. This was uh, way ahead of what was going on in the West in the, at that time. So now they're reopening that Cheng He route. In fact, when, when Xi Jinping announced the, uh, the, uh, the Maritime Silk Road, he stopped in Malaysia and met with Dr. Mahathir, the former prime minister there, and they formed the Cheng He Association to promote this idea of the peaceful collaboration between all of Asia with China, going back to the time of Cheng He. The only other thing I'll mention, uh, uh, Helga mentioned that Nicaragua is building a new Panama Canal through Nicaragua. It's already begun this month. It's starting this month. And they're not a member of the BRICS, but this is how the BRICS process is expanding. Egypt, also not a member of the BRICS, is building a second Suez Canal. It's through this impulse of development that's now spreading throughout the world everywhere except for Europe and the United States, which is grabbing people's imaginations and putting them to work, getting their minds going, getting the education process going, unleashing what in fact can be a basis for peace rather than war. Um, okay, I'm gonna sort of jump ahead. 
for time reasons. This is the last issue of our weekly magazine, Executive Intelligence Review. And this picture is also on the pamphlet that we have on why America must join the BRICS. Uh, these are the five BRICS leaders, Mr. Zuma from South Africa, Xi Jinping, uh, Delma Rousseff from Brazil, Mr. Modi from India, and Vladimir Putin. And you can see the enthusiasm and optimism on their faces, I think. I think it shows through uh, in, a, in a very clear way. Um, the, how, how are we going to fuel this? There are several issues. One is how are we going to pay for it, and one is how are we going to fuel it. And I think these two issues are addressed in great detail in this, in this book. By the way, it also addresses in great detail what Dennis went through in terms of Alexander Hamilton and the American system of credit rather than monetary system. But um, this is a, a, an idea that I think Lynn discovered, actually, or, or came up with this concept of energy flux density. And in a sense, it characterizes the whole history of mankind. Uh, when Prometheus gave man fire and defied the Olympian gods, who were really just the oligarchs of their day, uh, who wanted to treat mankind as just a herd of animals that could be culled or could even be uh, made extinct. And Prometheus said, no, I'm going to give the, the, the fire to mankind. And with fire, man was able to develop technology. Uh, and through uh, learning how to master the laws of the universe, using fire to forge tools and begin to develop ideas that could create machines, discovering principles that could begin to build machines, we then were able to go to higher levels of energy flux density so that when you use coal instead of wood, you're expanding it multiple times. When you move on to oil, of course, oil was just something that destroyed your agricultural land. It was just this oily mess that messed things up until we developed machines through our minds that transformed that annoying substance into one of the most valuable resources in the world for mankind. And it's precisely that concept of developing higher orders of, of human knowledge about the laws of the universe which transform things that are not uh, resources to us today to resources, which refutes the whole environmentalist greeny ideology that we have limited resources. We don't. With new technologies, things that are not resources become valuable resources. As with nuclear power, when we discovered the secret of the atom, suddenly we were able to explode huge amounts of energy. And with fusion, which we must have as rapidly as we possibly can, we're basically creating unlimited amounts of energy using things like seawater as our fuel, or even better, using the helium-3, the best fuel for fusion, which the Chinese are now doing what America wanted to do in the 19, 1980s and 90s, which is to mine helium-3 in the moon. But of course, we don't have a space program anymore. The Chinese do, and they're com committed to it as a mission for all of mankind. Um, I want to read to you another quote. This is the first paragraph from our chapter on nuclear power. It's by Ramtanu Maitra, our associate uh, a nuclear physicist originally from India. He says, more than 1.2 billion people, more than 20% of the world's population are today without access to electricity. And almost all of them live in developing countries. This includes 550 million people in Africa and more than 400 million in India. It is incumbent on all world leaders to bring this number to zero at the earliest possible date, and thus provide all people with a future to look forward to within a span of 25 years. Can this be done with fossil fuels, wind, and solar? The answer is a resounding no. Now, you'll be glad to know that Vladimir Putin was in India in the last three days. <coughs> he agreed to build 12 nuclear plants for India, potentially 24 over the longer term. Uh, there is a, if you look at the world map of where the nuclear power plants are today, you'll see they're concentrated in the United States and in Europe and in Japan. The United States, however, hasn't built a nuclear plant in 40 years. Europe, Germany is the heartland of Europe. There's some exceptions, but Germany, under Angela Merkel, this asset agent of the British banks, is shutting down Germany's nuclear power, just as she refused to build maglev high-speed rails in Germany. Japan has no nuclear power plants functioning today. There's 50 dots there, 50. 
They had 50 nuclear plants. And due to the environmentalist hysteria after Fukushima, at which nobody died, thousands died from a tsunami, but nobody died from the nuclear accident. There were a serious nuclear accident, which cost a lot of money and a lot of work, but nobody died. And yet they shut down the entire nuclear industry, which is literally genocidal. It's death, not only for the Japanese people, but for the world, because Japan has one of the best nuclear industries. In fact, America can't build nuclear plants today. We can no longer forge containment vessels for nuclear plants. We have to buy them from Japan or Russia. You think we're going to buy them from Russia? You know. But uh, the, the big block, that what Tano lies out in this article, is that we, if we're going to lay, raise the, the level of electricity usage and power usage by the human race to the level of approximately what we have in the U.S., maybe today or 20 years ago, uh, it's going to require about 5,000 new nuclear plants by about 2050. So that's about 200 per year. We can do it, but the problem is that we don't have the industrial capacity to do it because we've shut it down. We've destroyed our own ability to produce in the United States and in Europe. And in Japan is unfortunately on the same, same path. So the next thing is water, power and water. This is a map of the major deserts in the world. Uh, Mr. LaRouche, uh, back in the 19, early 80s, I believe, launched something called the Oasis Plan after a trip to Iraq and Israel, uh, where he made the obvious point that in the Middle East, where water is more valuable than oil, really, if, you, if you're thinking about the future, uh, that there had to be a mass Oasis Plan to create water resources by building canals through the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, building uh, replenishing aquifers, massive nuclear resalinization procedures, and other things. I won't go through it now. We've updated that. It's in the report. I, I really encourage all of you to get this report and, and study it, make it your, 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 your Bible for the next year, getting it to everybody you can. Um, but I want to address two issues. One is China and one is the United States, where you see the, the Gobi Desert is sort of the end of this strip of desert in China and the Great American Desert, which is the, the Southwest and, and Northern Mexico. This is the NAWAPA project, the North American Water and Power Alliance, something developed in the 1950s by the Parsons Company, which JFK was ready to go. He was gonna start this. It would have been the greatest infrastructure project in the, in the history of mankind, to bring huge amounts of water down from Alaska that are now wasted draining out into the ocean down through the Rocky Mountain Trench into the Great American Desert and Northern Mexico. It would have doubled the agricultural land in America. It would have transformed the climate. This is real climate change, not the nonsense about carbon. Climate change by bringing enough water in that the, re the precipitation process begins and you begin to change the climate of deserts, greening the deserts. That's climate change. Uh, but of course it didn't happen. When Kennedy died, we not only went to war, colonial war in Asia, we not only basically ended our space program uh, and other horrible things, uh, but we also saw the Noapa project scrapped, a boondoggle, it was said. So it never happened. And the result, I, I hope you know, I, California and Texas are now destitute. 20% of the farms in California are shutting down because there's no water. Our herds, our beef herds in Texas, are now at the level of 1951 with, what, half again as many people or more. I mean, we're, we're destroying our food base and we're destroying these, there's going to be ghost towns all over the Southwest because there's no water. This drought is not going to end. This is due to solar phenomena. It's not due to global warming. It's not gonna end right away. And it's too late to build Nawapa. We can't even do it now because it takes too long. We have to have emergency nuclear resal desalinization processes launched immediately to simply save this valuable part of America. Now look at China. About the same time we shut down Nawapa, the Chinese were faced with the fact that there's a huge water basin in the south along the Yangtze River and a total destitute coming out from the Gobi Desert, but also the extremely dry north. Beijing itself is just totally short of water. So the Chinese did what we didn't. They launched a massive project to bring water from the south to the north. 
you see these three routes, the red lines there. Uh, they had a plan to bring one along the east, which is along the, the route of the old uh, Grand Canal, uh, and one in the central part of the country, and then several way out in the west, these two small ones that move from the, uh, from the, uh, the feed water of the Yangtze up to the Yellow River to bring it around through the desert. The first two are now operating this year. They opened this year. They're now delivering huge amounts of water to the north. Just in the last weeks, actually, the, the central one opened up and they're now beginning to build the third one, right? The American system. Now, if you look at this drawing, it's a little hard to see, but you can, this is a rail and water uh, development map for China. But this is almost 100 years old. This was 1919, when Sun Yat-sen, the father of the, of the Chinese Republic, who was educated in Hawaii by American followers of Abraham Lincoln and Henry Carey, who was educated in the policies of a man named Alexander Hamilton, after whom the conference today, who wrote about Hamilton as the core concept creator of what had to be used to bring China out of its colonial destitution and become a modern nation again. All right. And he talked about, he, he wrote a thing called The Three Principles of the People, which was the basis of the Chinese Revolution, based explicitly on Abraham Lincoln, the idea of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This was the American system idea. Now, it didn't happen, it's a long story, it didn't happen then, but it's happening now. This is today's Chinese rail grid, and you can see it's very close to what Sun Yat-sen proposed. Uh, it doesn't show, although you can imagine, that these extend out on these land bridge ideas. I'll show you that in a second. Both to the north into Russia, into the west, into Kazakhstan, down south into Southeast Asia, and of course crisscrossing the country. The, you can't see it too well, but all those blue lines are high-speed rail. They're going to soon have 18,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. In the United States, you know how many miles we have of high-speed rail? Zero. Zero. We were about to build one in Florida in the 1990s. It was all set to go. And then they elected a guy governor by the name of Jeb Bush. And his first act was to cancel the high-speed rail project, a boondoggle. Right? The, the legislature was so angry that they put a, 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 a resolution on the ballot for people to vote, changing the Constitution, making the Constitution say we must have high-speed rail. And it passed. And it passed. And then the governor refused to fund it. He vetoed the funding bills. And then he managed to get the whole thing scrapped. So this is, yeah, Heil Hitler. Uh, so this is just one of the many reasons that Jeb Bush has to be destroyed. By the way, the release of that torture report has done a lot of damage to Jeb Bush and his Nazi uh, progenitors, uh, which is good. Uh, I, I'll mention, though, that Larry Summers one of the people who brought about the entire financial blowout in 2007 and 2008, uh, just said in a, a week ago or so, he said, we don't need any of this fancy high-speed rail stuff. We should just fix up what we got. Just like, like Obama is famous for having said, we don't need any of this fancy fusion stuff. We can use windmills and, and solar panels. Yeah. So uh, now if you take Here's, here's the Chinese rail. If you look in the far west, this is a focus on Xinjiang, which is the province in the far west of China. Uh, you, what you hear about is that there's upheavals, there's terrorism, the Chinese are suppressing the rights of these people and so forth. Well, you know, the people there were living a, a very poor life, very low lifestyle, half of them are illiterate, and now they're being educated, now they're getting jobs. That's a whole story. But what they're doing in particular is those red lines are two high-speed rail connections from the east of China into Urumqi and Kashgar, the two capitals of the two major cities. And then from there, out into Central Asia, through Kazakhstan, through Kyrgyzstan, down through into Pakistan, and in particular into Afghanistan, which is very crucial. Both the Chinese and the Russians are extremely concerned about what's going to happen in Afghanistan as the U.S. pulls out because all we did while we were there was turn it into the biggest heroin-producing nation in the history of the human race, where they produce more opium in that country than the entire world has ever produced in, in a year. Uh, and as we turn it back to the drug lords and to the terrorists, 
uh, as Viktor Ivanov, the Russian drug czar, said, Afghanistan is the home of the Second British Opium War. The first one, of course, in the 1840s and 60s against China. This one, mostly against Russia in Eastern Europe. So they're very concerned, and how do you deal with it? You deal with it through development. Uh, and the Russians have their own plan for this. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, their own plan is based on a, a plan by a, a good friend of ours, Yuri Krupnov, who wants to take the southern Siberia region, where Novosibirsk, the science city, is, uh, and use that science and technological capacity to move down through Central Asia to produce secondary industries across Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan, and then into Afghanistan with tertiary industries, high-speed rail development, uh, and so forth. Again, uh, and the British are, you'll, you'll read it everywhere, the Russians and the Chinese can never agree on this. They're competing. Well, that's the British great game concept. And I can tell you for sure that Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Lavrov and others are constantly saying, we will work together on development. This is not going to be manipulated by the imperial powers this time around. We have to solve the problem of development. Um, now, I, this, I, this I think is the best diagram of the difference between European colonialism and what is being done by the BRICS nations today. This is a before and after. On the left are the railroads that exist now in Africa. Right? And you can see it looks mostly like knives sticking into the gut of Africa. Right? Because all the British and the Dutch and the Portuguese and so forth cared about was getting the raw materials out. So they built rails from the ports to the, to the mines, got the raw materials out, nothing connecting any countries, nothing crossing Africa. Right? There were, they, in fact, that was intentional. They didn't want countries collaborating. Right? Now look at the right. This is what's proposed now, mostly by the Chinese, but with some Japanese and Korean and other input as well. Uh, as Helga mentioned, a, a railroad, well, no, she didn't mention this one. They're going to build a, rail from, a railroad across Africa from Djibouti to, uh, from the Dakar in Senegal to Djibouti. Uh, uh, Li, Li Keqiang, the, the premier, when he was there, promised that they, the, the Chinese would build high-speed rail connecting every capital of, of Africa. So they need raw materials, I assure you, and they're exporting, uh, uh, importing a lot of raw materials from Africa. But the difference is that they're paying for them. They're not paying for them with, with pieces of paper, which really are debts with which they control these countries. They're paying for it with infrastructure, with schools, with hospitals, with railroads, with dams, water projects. They're creating real nations that can be true collaborators, uh, exactly what our founding fathers intended and what uh, Franklin Roosevelt intended after the war had he lived. The South America is, is basically the same. Helga mentioned they're building a railroad from Peru to Bolivia. Same thing. We, we had a book called The United States of Latin America sometime in the 1980s, basically laying out an even more aggressive plan than this to connect the countries of South America, to crisscross South America, make it possible for them to develop the way America developed, through connectivity, through connections, making it possible to get beyond the colonial control. Dennis already took care of this one. This is, how do you pay for it? Well, you pay for it by using creditary systems rather than monetary systems. What Hamilton discovered was that we could have a creditary system through national banking where the government didn't have to borrow from the private banks or from the British or from Wall Street. We could create credit ourselves. We could generate that credit through the private banking system, but with strings attached. You can only use this for things that uplift the general welfare of the population that create higher levels of productivity in water, power, roads, transportation, education, health, and so forth. That's the American system of national banking, which we can and must restore. The BRICS are generally using this kind of approach, although it must be said that they're really largely using the huge resources piled up in China as a result of what, what they did there. Uh, and in, in the long run, we have to bring the world around to this idea that you don't need to have stores of money 
or borrowed money, you can actually generate credit if you have a creditary system based on Hamilton's ideas, uh, as Sun Yat-sen understood. Um, I'm going, to, and then I, the other, I won't go through it now, but the obvious point about this, we have to stop being earthlings. We have to follow Kraft Erika's idea of the ter extraterrestrial uh, imperative of mankind, reaching out into the universe. We were doing it here in America, uh, that was scrapped. The Chinese are doing it now. This is the U-2 that's now on the moon that the Chinese sent up there, and they have a process by which they want to start mining uh, helium-3, bringing it back to Earth to fuel the nuclear reactors. This is their nuclear reactor, the East Tokamak, that the Chinese are working on. And in fact, while the idiot American Congress and its idiot president have outlawed collaboration between NASA and the Chinese space scientists, even though they're now getting ahead of us, but we banned it because they're bad guys and we don't want them to steal our technology. Well, <laughs> we, we better start stealing theirs pretty quick. Uh, uh, but on fusion, that's not true. There's still very close collaboration between American fusion scientists and the Chinese, which is extremely important. Now, I'm gonna end with a brief comment on Chinese philosophy. I spent a long time <clears throat> as a ward of the state studying Chinese philosophy uh, and comparing Chinese philosophy to, uh, to the uh, Western Renaissance. And the works of Confucius and Mencius and, and mo even more important, really, Zhu Xi and the Sung Dynasty in the 12th century. But it's very important that what Helga has really emphasized is that when the Chinese came out of this horrendous cultural revolution between about 66 and 76, which was a total dark age. It was an all out, and it was manipulated and they were driven into it by British. But what they did was, was totally self-destructive, attacking not only Western culture, but Chinese culture. Uh, a major part of the Cultural Revolution was the anti-Confucius campaign, where children were told not to read the classics, not to learn their history. Uh, when that ended, when Deng Xiaoping began to bring China out of this nightmare, uh, the, I think one of the most, it was opening up to the West, it was sending tens of thousands of people out. We have a chapter in the book on what Deng Xiaoping did to bring China out. Sending thousands and thousands of students around the world, who now are coming back as trained scientists and engineers and are doing all of this stuff. Um, but a, a major part was the Confucian revival, bringing back the Confucius and Mencius, his, his follower, 150 years later, these ideas. What Confucius taught, and at the time China was not united, he would go from kingdom to kingdom and he'd say, yes, okay, you're the leader, you have the, what they called the mandate of heaven. But if there's strife in, in the kingdom, the mandate of heaven will be taken away from you. It's very much like our Declaration of Independence. If, if you're, you know, being mistreated, the people have the right to take that power back. Uh, and he said that people, like Plato, he said people are born with qualities of agape, ren, and righteousness and knowledge. Uh, and people are not animals. We have this amazing creative power of the mind which distinguishes us from animals. Those things are there. Mencius, or Confucius said, you have these principles inside you. You're born with them. If you seek for them, you will find them. If you neglect them, you'll lose them. And Mencius, beyond that, said that if there is strife in the, in the, in the population, if people are not provided with a, a, a livelihood with which they can sustain themselves, then people's minds will be drawn to all kinds of degradation and licentiousness and crime. But, he said, for the government then to come back and arrest them for their crimes, this is entrapment. This is entrapment of the people, right? Now, if you think what's going on in America today with Ferguson, I, I, I understand there's a big demonstration today about, about uh, racism, Obama fanning the flames of racism. There's no question but there's racism, but is that natural to people? Is, this, is what we're seeing now today something that's the real human coming out in us? No, quite the opposite. This is precisely because we've destroyed our economy. Ferguson was a, a prosperous area with auto plants and steel plants. People were living middle class lives with good jobs. That's destroyed, right? So what happens? Instead of following the, the Westphalian principle of the other, 
that our interests are the interests of the other, which made Western civilization possible. Right? Instead of that, we see people striking out at the other, at the other nation, the other race. Right? How do you solve this? You don't solve it by fanning racism. You solve it by addressing the cause of this problem, as Mencius did, and as the founders of Western civilization did when they ended the, uh, the religious wars in Europe by saying the nation state depends on the interests of the other being our interests. Right? Which is precisely what we have to do internationally, get America to join the BRICS, and it's what we have to do in America by getting every single citizen to have access to what can be the future of mankind if we truly start acting like human beings and take into consideration the common aims of mankind. So thanks. <laughs> Levels of torture carried out by Bush and Cheney uh, and continued under Obama despite the fact that he banned torture and continued under Obama in the sense that he has refused to bring prosecution against these international criminals and he has continued to refuse to release major portions of the document showing them to be criminals, despite the fact that even the United Nations says that international law doesn't suggest that they be brought on criminal charges. It demands that these criminals be brought to justice. And this includes emphatically, in the words of Ben Emerson, the UN uh, rights, human rights rep uh, rapporteur, that this means the people at the top who, who brought about this process. This has, a second incident happened just in the last few days when in the passing of the budget to prevent another government shutdown, the collaboration between President Obama and the Republican leadership and Wall Street rammed through a rider to the budget bill which wiped out the little tiny piece of the Dodd-Frank bill which actually did something, which prevented the banks from doing some of their derivative trade, their gambling, off to a different institution which would not be backed up by the taxpayers by government bailout. The Citibank wrote a, 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 a rider that said, let's do away with that. Uh, it was lobbied, there was a revolt by both Republicans and Democrats, by Tea Party Republicans and Progressive Democrats against this treason against America, literally saying we're going to allow not only another 2007, 2008 collapse, but something far, far bigger, since we now have two to four trillion, quadrillion, quadrillion, a, a thousand trillion dollars in these gambling debts sitting in our banking system, which they're now saying we have to bail out yet again. But the, the result of this, this barely passed, and it, it barely passed because our political parties are now in shambles, both the Republican and the Democratic Party. The fact that Obama collaborated so blatantly with, with not only Wall Street, but with Jamie Dimon personally, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, who personally got on the phone with Obama and with Boehner to demand that this policy be put through. And we'll hear more about that from another speaker today. So the, America is on a, a cusp. We're in a position of tremendous upheaval. It's directionless outside of what we, we provide. And this report is, in a sense, a handbook that you can present to anybody in America or anybody in the world and say, you want to get out of this disaster, you better, and here's the way to do it. Here's exactly what can be done. So I want to review this a bit. The, to do it, I want to give a little bit of history. In 1983, uh, Lyndon LaRouche succeeded in getting Ronald Reagan to adopt a policy known as the Strategic Defense Initiative. It got called Star Wars, but it was called the SDI. Actually, LaRouche called it Beam Weapon Defense. We had or Our keynote presentation today, The New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge, will be given by Mike Billington, Executive Intelligence Review Asia Desk, and a co-author of the report. Mike? Click on that? Yeah. It's on there already. Start it up. Yeah. No. Yeah, good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you all. <clears throat> we've, we've heard clearly from Dennis uh, of what the American system tradition is, the system of Alexander Hamilton. 
Uh, <clears throat> and we've heard from Helga of the stark um, choice that we have to make today. Uh, very much like the choice that uh, Martin Luther King made, where each individual is faced with the question of whether or not they will take up the mission to deal with a crisis th which threatens literally all of civilization. And uh, I want to go through today with you the uh, general contents of this report, an extraordinary report, which we worked on for almost a year, uh, a follow-up to an earlier report that was done in 1997, which I'll discuss a little bit, uh, in the sense that this report poses the solution that we have to convey to the American people, to the European people, and to the world. That there is an alternative. Organized for this for six or seven years. The idea being that the world at the time was, gu was guided by the British idea of MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. That Russia and the US both had massive nuclear weapons capacities. We both knew that if we started a war, we'd blow each other up, and that's supposed to stop war. Well, okay, but it also kept the world divided. There was no way of bringing the world together around dealing with the issues that face the common aims of mankind. And LaRouche said this is insane. We have to use new scientific concepts, new uh, technological ideas to bring these two sides together. And the idea was build space-based particle beam and laser beam defense systems that could stop nuclear missiles, could stop a nuclear war, could end war forever potentially if it was coupled with the Hamiltonian kind of economic policies that Dennis discussed. So this, uh, Ronald Reagan adopted that program when LaRouche got to know Reagan during the electoral campaign and subsequently. Uh, it, it was rejected by the Russians who were then led by a British asset named Andropov uh, and it was ultimately undermined in the United States when Reagan was shot in an assassination attempt and subsequently succumbed to the Alzheimer's and his vice president, George Bush, ended up taking over, largely running the administration and then becoming president. The son <coughs> of Prescott Bush, who personally financed the initiative to the disaster now spreading through Europe and the United States, economic collapse and the onrush to a war which will become, perhaps within days or weeks, a thermonuclear confrontation which could lead to uh, the end of civilization. Uh, the alternative lies, ironically, in rediscovering the American system. And what we see in the contents of this report, that most of the rest of the world, outside the United States and Europe, is now engaged in one of the most fantastic uh, unleashing of industrial, uh, infrastructural, scientific, education policies that the world has ever seen. You could perhaps compare it to what Roosevelt did in the 1930s, but that was just in the United States, although it had the potential of going international. It didn't. Uh, unfortunately, when Roosevelt died, the, uh, his follower, Mr. Truman, helped the British back into their colonies, which Roosevelt intended never to happen. But now we have the opportunity, and it's not being led by the United States, it's being led by the BRICS nations and largely by China. And I want to go through that. Let me just mention that this last week here in the United States has seen an extraordinary uh, explosion of political rage over two, many issues, but particularly two issues. You're all familiar, of course, with the fact that a very courageous Democratic Senator, Dianne Feinstein, uh, withstanding massive pressure, released this report on the 